I'm Tom Leonard. I'm the host of the Gamers Change Lives podcast. Now, when it comes to esports, I am not an expert. I'm more of an explorer. The goal of the podcast is to talk to esports entrepreneurs around the world to hear how esports can create jobs and maybe inspire others to do the same. Our tagline is play games, create jobs, change lives. Now we're in season two and we're talking with esports um, experts in sponsorship, investment, merchandising, and other ways to generate revenue because one of the things that you always find out is it takes money to create these jobs. We call this season Follow the Money. Really happy to have two great guests here from two different continents. Trev Keen, who's the director um, eSports strategy at Epic Global and advisor judge at Stadia Ventures. And Cholwe Shabukali, co-founder and managing director at Team Gematrix and a Zambian eSports uh, pioneer. So welcome to both of you. Trev, where are you uh, talking to us from? I'm in a place called Kilkenny in the southeast of Ireland. Um, so it's um, it's great to be uh, to be on the show, and uh, and I'm loving the fact that we've I'm got uh, two different continents, two different continents um, represented. Yeah. So, represented. So, it so it just shows the uh, how, how yeah. small about how, how big small esports about how is. Big esports is. Yes. 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 So, uh, Choli, so, uh, where are you speaking Choli, from? Where are you speaking from? Hi, uh, so I'm speaking from uh, Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, I, I like to believe that Zambia is like the heart of Southern Africa, and we hope that most of the opportunities for esports come from our center. <laughs> great, great. Hey, could, could you both each you talk a little bit about how you got started? How you got started. Uh, we're hearing an echo uh, we're there. We're hearing an echo there. How you each got started in esports? Get e-sports? Oh, I mean. oh. So, um, so uh, Choe, how, did you, how did you get started in esports? Started in esports. Um, so I've been playing video games, uh, ever since I was like six or seven. Uh, my first, uh, video game was, uh, Mortal Kombat on, uh, PS2. Uh, so that's really when I started off. Then after that, I got into Contra and, uh, more, more of the other Sega games. Um, so that was really the birth of my passion for gaming. Um, then uh, about 2015, I got to attend uh, a gaming convention by an organization called Nedotaku by friend, some friends of mine. And there, that, that was when I saw esports for the first time. I saw people playing Injustice and Mortal Kombat, and I was so inspired by the competitiveness. But my actual business journey started in 2017. Uh, when uh, my co-founder and I, uh, Prince Musole, uh, decided to do a business in gaming. So we didn't want to just do um, something more of a hobby, like an event for a hobby. We wanted to create a sustainable uh, business within esports or gaming, but we didn't know how. So we joined uh, an incubator called Bongo Hive, and then we got to know um, a lot about what starting a business is, business models, revenue streams. And after that, it really kick-started our foundation. We did an event, uh, found some talent, signed a few players. Uh, within a month, we were at our first uh, Sub-Saharan Africa tournament in Kenya, and we won. Uh, then after that, it was uphill from there, and uh, we've won about over six championships. And uh, we've represented our country and uh, brand in the US, Ireland, South Africa, uh, Kenya, and Zambia as well. That's great. No, all That's kinds great. of great experience, no, all, all kinds of things, things to talk about things there. About. Trev, what gets you into, Trev, what gets you into um, um, esports? Esports. Yeah, very, um, very different very, journey. Um, very different um, journey. Um, what you I, didn't start with Mortal Kombat? I didn't start with Mortal Kombat, <laughs> with Mortal Kombat <laughs> no. And um, as you can um, tell by the hair, I'll give a can't listening I'll can't, but I'm a lot older than than what I sound. So, I mean, I mean, for me, I mean, I grew up gaming. Um, you know, whether it was, you know, Mega Drives, whether it was Commodore's PlayStation, moving on. So, they were a big part of my life in the in the nineties and esports was a foreign term. I mean. I, mean, I, I can remember I, I can getting, remember you know, getting, you know the, the, the first the edition first of FIFA that ever came out. My, my father got, got it for me in, in, in Asia, in and we had to take it apart because it wouldn't fit in. Cartridges were bigger, and we used to have these tournaments with my friends, but but we didn't know. We we were just hanging. We were just playing games, and that continued all the way through. And like there was games like Pro Evolution Soccer, John Luma Rugby, and. And, and Dune and, and like these and games were just part of our lives, you know. We all lived together in apartments, apartments and, and, and 
and then there was a gap and as you traveled and, and, and I worked in finance, worked finance you know casually you games casually and then about games, and then 2014, 2014 2015, 2015 I, I, I actually started I, I actually to look into this and I was like wow this okay wow, there's actually okay, these competitive games going on around the world and I made the decision made to the decision uh, get an EA license with a guy, license, um, a guy, a guy um, friend of mine, Jeff Wilson, who's just, just, just a fantastic sports marketer. And we set up this tournament. We, we, this we had connections in football, and we, we, we got eight football clubs, eight aspiring FIFA players. players. We created a tournament. We took the last bit of money we had and bought the license. And and that's just kicked off what has been an incredible, a very grateful journey to have gone on, to be honest with you. So, yeah, and it's eight years and counting now. Great. No, no, I, I can hear the excitement in your voice when you're talking about it. About it's it. like somewhere along the line you figured out you can play games for a living. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, it, it's. I love it in this house because, like, you know, like, you know, you know, most kids, you know, they get to play with their dad and they're joyous, and you know, for me, it's I get to play with my kids. A game of Fall Guys, and I'm secretly researching it to see is there something we can do here that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You know, if I lose, if I lose my kid at FIFA, I can play him again because I'm competitive, but I like the game and I want to see where it goes. You know, and so the house is, you know, it's just a blend for me of of trying out these games, seeing what works, and yeah, it's fantastic. No, no, it sounds great. No, it sounds hey, great. to hey, jump into the, the topics into the, here, the topics I want to here. talk first about sponsorship. About sponsorship. And in particular, because sponsorship is kind of the basic is model kind of the basic for funding for esports funding events e-sport all around events the world. All around the world. And so, um, so Choe um, in Choe Zambia, what, who are the main sponsors, what, who are the main sponsors of esports in your country? Esports in your country. Mm. Um, so, esports in terms of sponsorships is really. Um, in its genesis, I should say, uh, because there's a lot of cultural barriers. Um, people still have that stigma with gaming. Uh, so even in our case, uh, most of our reach of people who are aware of uh, our brand and what we're doing is outside our country, um, outside the region, as opposed to within the, the country. Um, so we find a situation where we have companies like Infinix. Uh, Infinix is uh, a smartphone uh, mobile company. They have been really uh, helpful in our growth, especially sponsorship and supporting us. Um, then uh, we also have um, ISPs that have some presence in gaming, such as Liquid uh, Technologies. They have some presence in gaming. They actually have some bundles for gaming going on right now. Um, we also have uh, TechX Hub. Uh, so TechX Hub is a company in uh, UAE, but uh, they have actually sponsored us uh, and partnered with us to provide us with uh, gaming peripherals for our team. So I'm actually wearing a Steel Series uh, headphone from TechX Hub. So yeah, there's a couple of companies that. <laughs> That's a good plug. That was a good plug. That was a good plug. Yeah. So uh, so you know um, what can I say? Uh, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So we have a situation where uh, companies are slowly conforming to the marketing value of esports. That's there when it comes to reaching uh, the younger demographic. So we're there for the long ride, and uh, we'll keep seeing which other companies uh, come into the the journey as well. So how's it different, so, uh, how's in, uh, it different Ireland in Ireland for you, Trev? Ireland for you, Trev. Um. Uh, I'm trying to work out how I'm you eat an elephant. I know it's one bite at a time, but where do you start? Um, I mean, I mean, it's interesting. I know where because, you don't start. Know where you don't start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because really there's very because there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities lot of between, between the Irish market and the, the African market. market, and the African um, market. Uh, in that Ireland's a very that, nascent Ireland's market. Very nascent market. The, the, the big difference, I think, is that, think is that in Ireland, in Ireland you've got these amazing, got these amazing gaming companies, gaming that, have companies that have their HQs. You know, you've, you know, you've, you've got, got um, you know, Activism Blizzard, you've Riot, Blizzard, your VA, Riot, all have European VA, headquarters. Have European but we don't have that but joint of thinking, thinking, you know, as a country. So, you know, you know. What I'll say is that there, there, there is definitely a shift coming. A shift coming. Uh, I think esports, um, I think itself, e-sports maybe, itself, maybe, uh, you know, um, we've, you know, we've had we've some, had some uh, what I would say, kind of challenger brands, brands, maybe that see gaming as a good vertical, as a good vertical um, to go into, um, so the likes of Unpost, who've done some work with um, with the collegiate um, esports scene, with, with, with a company called Legion, which has been great to see. And then you've kind of smaller brands that maybe have dipped their toes in, and you've other brands that, again, have dipped their toes in, brands like Lucas. Like tree, 
but you're, you're, you haven't seen a holistic seen kind of holistic full-on kind of approach, full on you know, approach. so it's, you know, so it's kind of sample it's budget here, it's small budget here, whereas what I would love to see, and, and, and I'm sure Trollway would love to see the same, is is a hero brand that kind of just, you know, just just comes in and leads from the top down and shows, you know, what can be done at a country level, because the opportunity is there, you know, you know, gamers, there's gamers, gamers in Ireland, there's gamers, you know, there's Ireland, gamers, you know, there's gamers you know, in Zambia, you know, in Zambia um, but both, both need a hero need brand a hero to kind of brand elevate it up. And, and, I, and I think that's the missing piece. piece. We're, we're, getting teasers, we're getting teasers, you know, of it, you know, the potential. Whereas, yeah, it's an whereas, interesting yeah. concept yeah. there yeah. to have uh, the hero brand. We talked to uh, Luca Ducconi from Red Bull South Africa, and he he had some really interesting ideas on on how to how to approach a sponsor because he's obviously approached a lot. And I know that Red Bull, I think, and I think Chile, I think you've had some interaction with Red Bull in South Africa as well, right? Uh, yes. Um, so um, we had a tournament that occurred by African Cyber League Gaming, ACGL, uh, where our players participated in the Warner Brothers tournament. And uh, Luca Tuconi was a shoutcaster and uh, Red Bull was really uh, supportive of that event. So that's as close as we got to the brand. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, yes, so maybe, yes. maybe, Trev, maybe, maybe you could describe, describe, it would be really interesting to hear really about, interesting a about a particular sponsorship, sponsorship that you were, were a part were of, a part of, of uh, acquiring, uh, acquiring for, for some of your activities there. If, if anything can, if anyone comes to mind, if you can kind of describe how you go out and identify and attract and sign a sponsor for a particular event or team. Or team. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I guess it, I, I guess it's, 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 ever it's ever evolving. So, you know, so, I, I can talk you know, about how, how we do it now, how we do and then I can talk about the rudimentary approach, approach we had, you know, when you I was know, starting out. Was so, starting out. Right so, now, so right now, we've got, a, you know, with an Epic Global, we've got a commercial team that are reaching out to brands constantly. You know, we we analyze the social of the teams we work with, we get a sense of of what their audience is. Affinity, affinity is for brands, is for and then, brands, we then we use um, an in-house yeah, system, in-house where, system we, where we where we, 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 we track and, track identify, and the identify the leads within those. Leads within those. And, and really, you're going and out, really you're going and out, you know, you're and, you you're, know, you're targeting, you're targeting kind, of key kind of key decision makers within these organizations, within these organizations and, their agencies, and their agencies. You know, we, you know, and I'll get to that in a second. But who pay a large part in that? And you know, you're trying you're trying to ascertain of where they are on their journey. You know, are they at the education phase where they're just learning, they're just learning or are they at the phase, they, phase where they, they're, they're ready to push the button on something? And then you have to, you really have to target the property, um, you know, um, to them, depending on the leg of their journey on it. And, you know, you know, a lot of the time, like a lot of the time, a brand is not ready for an esports sponsorship. You know, so gaming, working with content creators, you know, especially as influencers, is is almost a Trojan horse to get into that hopefully bigger conversation for them and leveraging off the content creators within in an esports team. So. So it's very important. It's very important. Um, if I go back, if I go a, few back a few years ago, I mean, you know, one of the biggest know, ones the biggest that, ones that I'm probably that, most that proud of is uh, is bringing is TikTok, TikTok to um to Tundra. Tundra. TikTok were, TikTok were um, uh, they were the front of shirt sponsor of Tundra's FIFA team, team and ended up having that that sponsorship and that digital kit in the game, and it was used millions millions of times. I can't think of the exact number, but it was a big number. number. Big number. Um, um, and that one is, and that one is it, it was just, it was, it was a just, very simple conversation. It was using tools like LinkedIn. LinkedIn. It, was it, was message, it was having a good message, you know, message, you know which I always felt it was, felt was important to have the right message to reach out and and hitting the right person at the right time. I mean, there's so much, so much. There's so much hard work that goes into getting any deal over the line, whether it's 1,000 or a million. But there's also what there's people also don't what realize people is don't realize there has to be an element of luck. It has to be the right person, be the right person. you know, and they have you to know, want to do something. To I, mean, something. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, I, 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 I should nearly I, print I, off I and frame, frame the nose I've got, nose I've got uh, and put them up on the wall. But the only thing is I wouldn't have enough wall space. So, you know, every time you get a yes, you know, it just... Just, you know, it, it, you know, it really, it really matters, really you know, matters, and, um, you know, and that's and, why um, every, that's the, the every, one deal that stands out, I guess, but the TikTok one was, was, one was, quite, good. was quite good. But what I would say but to anybody say that's chasing sponsorship, you know, in esports is the importance of agencies, you know, 
know, agencies working agencies with brands, working they've with controlled brands, the budget, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily you know, direct, you, know, direct, I mean, you do need to get in and build that relationship with the brand, but ultimately they will build that trust with you and read the rest to their brand, sorry, to their agency, who has that particular spend that you need, and and that's that's very important to um to know and if 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 you can find you know um brands that are transition with agencies you know are you know not yet have pointed an agency then they absolutely absolutely represent a fantastic opportunity for you but that takes a lot of research time and patience no congratulations on tiktok because i think they are one of i've always heard that they are one of the hardest companies to, to land a deal with for all kinds of things. So that's, that, that's, that's really impressive, uh, I think. Uh, anyway, from, from, from an advantage point here, can you talk just, just briefly, what kind of time frame was there on the TikTok deal? How much time did it take before you made the first connection to there was money in the bank? Yeah, so, so uh, my longest deal at the moment, just to put everything in context, is 18 months. You know, and um, that that went live a few weeks ago, um, and that was a lot of you know blood, sweat, tears. Will it happen? Paperwork, and it's amazing from mm -hmm. actually getting the verbal commitment to yes, let's do something, to actually getting a signed contract. You know, is what takes a, takes a while. So TikTok took in total. It was about three to four weeks. We had we had an actual proposition in place of what, you know, the bones of, um, of a structure of an agreement would look like. It actually took two and a half months to three months after that to, um, to close out because of, uh, of the legal side of things. So I think that's something that, that, again, people need to be, you know, very cognizant of is there's, there's a couple of steps. Yes, you've got to find the right person. You've got to, uh, you know, agree in a broad of, well, does your ask match with what they're willing to spend and where's the wiggle room there? Then you've got to get that into, you know, some form of an agreement, whether it's a, memora a memorandum of understanding or whether it's a full agreement. That has to be signed off by various legal parties outside of that. And then you still have payment terms after that. So the money might land, the full amount might land into the bank 12 months after that deal is done. You know, so... There's there's a lot of steps here that 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 need to be followed, and I think that's um, that that's very important that uh, that pe that people understand that. Oh, that, that that was one of the one of my core competencies of working over here at Warner Brothers was my ability to work with the legal department, because everything I mean, I, I mean it was it was almost impossible to bring on a new vendor, because the legal uh, I mean it, it was just I mean, it it was crazy. It was like months and months. And uh, on one hand, the legal department was a very big part of everything that we did at Warner Brothers. But at the same time, it was important that we protect. We're working on Harry Potter. We're working on Lord of the Rings. I mean, we're, the, the properties that we're working on, you, you need that kind of, of, uh, of support. Hey, one of the things I was going to ask you about is what was success, let's say, with TikTok? Yeah, what, what, what were they looking for? Were they looking for views? Were they looking for... Were, were they looking for views? What, what was the what was what did success look like from the TikTok side on on your deal? Yeah, I, I think it was the fact to be seen as as innovative. Um, you know, when you're, you know, when when you're in, it was brand awareness. It was reaching that new audience. You know, and it it, it it's almost a sense of irony to be an app within a game you know, in terms of your advertising. So I think there was that element of it that was that was really interesting for them. And I think then, you know, creating the brand awareness, brand you know, awareness. and I mean, you this know, is early doors for TikTok early as well. You know, it's, it, it, it's well, coming you know, on three years now, you know, since, since I started. Now, so it, since I started. it wasn't as big as, as what it was now either. But it was, it, it remains was, their first, it, it remains um, I think, their first esports sponsorship, you know, and the done one or two since um, on that. Oh, that's great. Great. Yeah, that's great. Chilway, great. Uh, on, Chilway, you were, you're, mentioning oh, you're mentioning that you were doing, um, you were doing some particular um, sponsorship, some particular deals. sponsorship what, deals. What, um, what, um, can, can you describe can one, you particular describe one particular that, one that, that worked, worked out really well, worked out really you thought, well, and kind of what it took to make that happen from your side? What it took to make that happen from your side? 
Yeah, um, I think one that worked really well was uh, our sponsorship deal with Infinix. Well, it wasn't really um, a sponsorship per se, but it was more like um, a collaboration for us to bring some value to them in terms of uh, putting their brand um, in the face of our community. So we did um, a tournament for them. We organized a tournament for them, which went really well in 2019. And uh, this year, we finally did um, more like an ad, like an actual advert with a player who's marketing a smartphone for gaming. So um, that was really exciting for us uh, because it shows the real value for a brand to actually show how their actual product is used by a gamer, by a popular gamer within the community so that other gamers could see themselves with the actual brand. So it creates that relationship uh, between the, the brand and the community. Community. So um, that was the first time a brand in Zambia has actually put their foot forward and done something like this. Uh, so it was pretty exciting to be part of uh, that project. And uh, we look forward to other projects that are coming up uh, between us and Infinix. Um, other than that, um, the other uh, sponsorship, I should say, that really uh, was uh, fruitful was uh, the one with TechX Hub, uh, where they sponsored... Um, our brand with uh, gaming peripherals. Uh, not only did they sponsor the players on the team, but they sponsored us with products that we could give to our communities uh, after they play certain tournaments. So if they play tournaments, they're able to win Steel Series peripherals. And uh, not only did they sponsor Zambia, but they actually sponsored Ghana, Zimbabwe, um, and I believe Nigeria as well with uh, gaming peripherals. So we're actually able to do like a cross-country tournament at some point between all of us who are partnered with TechX Hub uh, so that we could actually, you know, do something cool and create more content around uh, our little community. So I think uh, those are the two brands that are notable for me to mention at this point. So, like I was asking so Trev, like was what, asking what's Trev, the t what, what was the time the, frame? The time frame. So let's say when you when you were doing the um the, uh, one of those deals, of those how long deals? did it take? You know, before, take, before the first the first, the first conversation, the first conversation and, when and when it was all done. And when it was all done. Did you cat? Did you hear me there? Did you cat? Did you hear me there? Are you, are, you, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. No, no it's like, oh, okay. yeah, no, I, I kind of like, lost, yeah, lost it on here. So okay. can you describe the time frame like I was asking Trev about for the, from the beginning to the end of the, uh, of one of those particular deals? Oh, uh, for example, when it came to the deal when we were doing the, the product advert, I think it took like three months. I should say three months because, you know, there's the initial meeting where you brainstorm about what you could do. And then there's uh, the back and forth internally that they may have in terms of their budgets and when they are ready to actually execute on it. And then you actually plan on when you can execute on it. Uh, then you have the execution uh, runway period. And then there's also the marketing period uh, when things go live. And then afterwards, there's the reporting and the back end of how, how did it go? Uh, did we hit our targets? Uh, what can we do next to, uh, you know, do better or reach the community better, things like that. So it takes time. Uh, deals are not, I think deals require patience. Uh, you have to be patient with uh, the brand you're communicating with because your urgency is not their urgency. <laughs> so, you, so you have to go in, in a good time. Uh, some companies here in Zambia require you to approach them three months before an actual event. So it's such to give them that time to actually ideate whether it's a good fit for them. But uh, yeah, so time depends on the company as well. So I think it also depends on when you approach them as well, because most companies want to finish their marketing budget towards the end of the year. So you, you have to approach them towards the end of the year and say, yeah, hey, we want to, want to do something with you next year. <laughs> uh, we know you have some money right now. Can you put it in the budget? We need to finish it, you know? So I think it's also, you have to be more aware of marketing. You have to be more aware of how marketing works and how the actual marketing managers you know, deal with their money and the time frames they have. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really important. That's, that's, that's how it was really always the, the, the trick also at Warner Brothers. It's like, yeah, we have no money right now. It's like, yeah, but if it was something we wanted to do next year, now's the time to talk to us, not next year. So, you're right. Do Are there agencies that you would work with there in Zambia, like, like Trev has in um, 
in Ireland? Maybe she's lost the connection there again. The wonders of the internet and editing. See if she comes back here. Yeah. So, so, so I, okay, here's one of the things I just realized. If you have two guests, if there's a problem with one, there's another guest right there you can be talking to. It's like, hey, what, uh, what, what, what am I complaining about? Tref, from your experience there, can you, can you think of things that might work differently in Ireland that you're picturing don't work the same in Africa? <coughs> so it's interesting, actually, because, uh, I mean, when I think of, of, of Ireland versus, versus a continent like Africa, obviously, uh, and there's different experiences all across the, uh, that, that, that particular landscape. But what always strikes me is that um, in large parts of Africa, it's mobile first. Yes. Or or at least it's on its way to being mobile first. So you look at games like maybe uh, Bang Bang um, or Free Fire, um, even PUBG. You know, they, mobile esports should be almost um, the, the gaming strategy of to choice for most organizations um, because it gives you a very um, larger pool to pull from. Um, I think that the second thing that maybe that, that and, and that's different, we'll say Ireland, which would be very much, you know, um, a PC and console first kind of gaming experience. Um, I also think that, um, you know, the, the pool of talent, I think, uh, um, is 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 probably um, is probably greater. And, and I think you can see that there's a real opportunity to link gaming to to education and STEM learning. At um at, at that level, I, again in some some African countries, you know, I'm, I'm I don't fully understand the landscape, and I'd be the first to hold my hand up on that. But it, it's something that that I think is a great opportunity in schools, and you can kind of see how that can that how that how that can grow. And the same applies to Ireland. Yet, you know, we, we haven't kind of we haven't broached that 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 topic um, at a, at a holistic level. You know, I, I think the same challenges probably um, that are in Ireland are, are, are in Africa. I think one is mainstream conversation is a challenge. I think two, I think brand adoption is, you know, is scattered. Um, and I think three, I think um, governmental support, you know, is not fully there yet. And I think, you know, there are three very big boxes that need to be ticked, you know, for when, when you... Um, when you talk about it and you know government governmental support doesn't necessarily have to be um it doesn't have to be about recognizing esport as a, as a sport that's not necessarily what the conversation needs to be about it's actually more about providing the, su the support for a person with a passion for esports that has the skill to be a top tier player to allow them the visas to travel just like an athlete would for a com uh, for commonwealth games or an olympic games um, or providing them the infrastructure so they can actually develop in a top tier environment with other top tier um, esports people. So that that's kind of what I'm talking about in that regard. So I, I think there's that there's a few nuances, but I think there's a lot of similarities as well, actually. Uh, that no, that's good to hear. Um, yes, esports is still esports. I mean, it's still the, the same. People people are playing FIFA, no matter where they are. I wanted to move on here to talk a little bit about investment. Because in particular, Trev, you, um, some of the work that you've done there with Stadia Ventures, as an example, it just looks really, really interesting. And one of the things, you know, we're talking about sponsorship as a way to get money to, to run the business right now. But what about starting it up? What about growing it and the potential for investment? Can you talk a little bit about um, how, where do teams and where do tournament or organizers where do they typically get their investment money from in your part of the world yeah um it's a it's a it's a great question uh, and it is something that's really really difficult to um to kind of pinpoint as one one answer you know so um I, i'm going to do my best um and i'll give you i'll give you some insight but 
I guess from an Irish from an Irish perspective, we're very lucky in that there is a fantastic ecosystem um, for people of an entrepreneurial mindset. You've got programs like New Frontiers. You've got programs like um, um, the NDRC coming out of, of, um, out, of dog uh, patch. out of Dog and Patch. And these, these back entrepreneurs with good ideas. We've also got a very strong angel network, um, angel investment network. So I think, you know, as a starting point, a start you're always told family and friends. Some people are fortunate enough that they can turn to family and friends. Others aren't. What I would look at is what acceler accelerator programs are in your country and, you know, building out your own proposition in your head that it is a really good, um, really good business that you're looking to develop out. I mean, I meet a lot of people at the moment that are building out tournament hosting platforms um, and they come for just some general advice, always happy to share. But I, I look at the tournament world right now and I think that's a really competitive space. You know, you've got, you know, challenger mode, you've battle for, you know, not to mention what the likes of uh, PlayStation can, can do with, within their own network in partnerships with, with, with providers. You know, you've smashed GG. I mean, and that star ladder, whatever it is, that, that, that there's so many tournament providers. Why would anybody go to look at, at, at investing in another another tournament provider? Whereas, you know, you, you maybe look at data points that can be captured, you know, from tournaments and games as a potential area for grow, for growth within an investment. So kind of it's really about building out what your idea and your proposition is, looking at what it is, seeing then who in your network can support you, going to local councils, going to accelerators and then going to angel funds and then working your way up the um, up the food chain but ultimately the only way to really have a successful business is to get customers get out there push yourself out there and uh, and build something smart do you uh, think that business do you find that when in talking to investors that there's a lot of education needed to get people to understand what esports is and how it might be a business investment yeah, I, I mean, of course. I mean, it, it's always good to to have an investor that 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 understands either your sector or your business model. You know, I think that's that's very important. I mean, if if they're passionate about your sector, I mean, it it can be good and a bad thing. Are they a passive investor? It can be a good or a bad thing. It depends on what they are. So it has to be a right a right fit all around. You know, and and people and you know, guilty of this myself to be fair. Um, maybe a story for another podcast, but, but like I've, I've had the wrong investor, you know, and it, it hasn't worked, but I was so obsessed with getting that, 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 that money in the door, you know, that I didn't think of, of, you know, the consequences, you know, and ultimately that business didn't, didn't do well because, you know, we, we weren't all, you know, it, it just, it wasn't the right investment strategy for it and it wasn't the right the right business model or it wasn't the right the right business at that particular time and that can be hard that can be hard to um you know for your confidence it can be hard for um for, for your soul i guess you know so it's very important and i think you know my advice for anybody is you know yes you know by all means look for look for investment but build out your proposition know what you are understand your value understand what you're bringing to the market and you know if you think you've got something that's really special as a as a business proposition maybe think bigger than than your region you know ireland in investment is very different from uk investment which is very different from us investment where you know if you write something on the back of a stamp you could be a unicorn within a day you know um so you know and you know, it's very important to kind of understand that. And, you know, investment's a young person's game as well at times, you know, in terms of, you know, you have to be willing to put in the graft and, and the um, and the uh, and the time. And if you think you're going to get lots of rejections from brands, wait till you get a rejection email from an investor. Um, so, yeah. yeah, fun in games, fun in games. Well, That's what it, we call it. It is. It is. And it's it, one of the things that, that I keep trying to tell people is, Think long term. It's like you can't think about, oh, I need, I need money this weekend. It's like, no, have a plan 
for the longer term. Joe, in uh, in Zambia, what does it look like for investment there? For let's say, if you want to start an esports business, are there sources of investment there that you can go to? Um. I think it depends on you. Uh, I, I think a lot of people in Zambia, okay, not a lot, but quite a couple of people in gaming are still looking at it as a hobby. Um, a lot of people don't really see it as something where they could make money. I think a lot of people are there at the joy of being a gamer, but not looking at it from the business side. So, you know, sometimes even myself, uh, I have to switch, you know, from being a gamer to actually being a business person. So it's a mindset switch. So a lot of us are stuck in the gaming mindset. Um, when it comes to getting investment, uh, there are a lot of grant opportunities that are coming up for women in, in technology. Uh, they're, they're, like Standard Chartered had... Um, a grant program that I was a part of. We didn't make it, but it was a good, a good uh, project where they were giving out ten thousand dollars to women in technology. Um, so there are a, a couple of uh, uh, grant programs that are coming up uh, through accelerators like Bongo Hive, and there's also Jacaranda Hub. I think they actually have some accelerator programs. But um, when it comes to funding, I think. What really matters is uh, what Trev said about building something valuable. And I think it's something that uh, one of uh, our co-owners, uh, he was an investor, but he was, he's an investor, but we call him a co-owner, he's a co-owner now. So, um, uh, Dr. Bruce Dunhams, uh, he's more like a mentor to me as well. He said, um, before the world can believe that, pun intended, I hope I, hope I can... I can curse a bit on this podcast. Oh, yeah, you can, say, you can say anything here. It's like, here. It's like... <laughs> okay, it's, it's like... No, so um, this is, this no, is where so the this, viewership this spikes. Where the viewership spikes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. PG-18, guys. Um, so, like, before the world uh, knows you're the shit, you have to believe you're the shit. So you have to build uh, the value. You have to build a product that you love and not... Not just you, but something that you know your community will love. Something that uh, would drive passion and unity. And that's where the kicker is. I believe once you build a community, um, you know, brands will start seeing the value in trying to get in your community, to get in the eyes of your community, in front of your community. So I believe you should start with uh, building your, your value concentrating more on your value before you start thinking of the money. Um, the money comes along the way. Sometimes money can, can come uh, early in your journey and it kills your business. But you have to build uh, value and build a team. A team that's going to be ready for the money <laughs> when it comes through. <laughs> uh, that, that's not just going to blow it on a Ferrari or something, but a team that's ready to actually utilize the money the right way. So those are two things uh, I believe people should really uh, look out for. Um, angel investment, I believe, is what I would go for. I wouldn't go for VC just as yet. A lot of VCs are talking about going into second round. Like I was talking to a friend of mine because uh, we were looking at funding opportunities, and a lot of uh, esports. VCs were saying will come in in the second round. So, which means now you have to focus on building your value, uh, building your drive. A lot of people are looking at tournament, uh, tournament platforms, just like Trev said. I've seen that so much. I'm guilty of it because we have kind of like a small tournament platform-ish situation on our, on our site as well. Uh, so there's that aspect that everyone is looking at, but we have to think broader into what value we can give uh, esports gamers and what value investors can actually benefit from in the long term. And we have, to, we have to also look at it from the business side, make money. How do we make money and grow the businesses? That's it. Yeah, that, that's, that's, the it. Whole yeah that's, that's the whole theme, theme of season two theme here. Of season can, you two here. Bit, can you talk a little bit, about, Choy, about, uh, about the, uh, um, about the um, accelerator? accelerator? I think you called it Bongo Hive. I think you called it Bongo can Hive. You, can you, can you tell a little bit to the audience about, describe a little bit about how you found out about them, what it was like to get accepted there, what was the application like, and what did what do you think you got out of it? What do you think you got out of it? Um, I was, uh, my best friend at the time and her husband introduced me to the accelerator idea because uh, I just wanted to start a business, but I didn't know how. So the greatness about accelerators is they shift your mindset to really not look at it from your passion, 
but look at it from how to structure your business, uh, create revenue streams, uh, also uh, focus on your persona, which target persona are you really looking at? Who's your real target for your particular esports organization or company? What are you really targeting? What are you really selling uh, to this audience? And um, how best uh, are you looking at growing your business? You know, you, you look at the value of, <laughs> okay, the value in a nutshell uh, that I can say is uh, it taught us to structure our business into four categories. Like we have operations, we have finance, finance the finance department, then we have the human uh, resource department where we deal with now operations in terms of the people in the organization. And then we have my favorite department, which is the dreaming department, where you just dream about the future. <laughs> <laughs> and how you're going to get to a certain point. So the 10-year plan. Uh, so th those are the valuable things I got from the accelerator. I got um, the drive to really think about it as a business and not just as fun. So it is fun. It's my passion. But really, how do I make the money to make my uh, partners uh, happy, make uh, our, our employees happy? and uh, also grow the business because you can't, uh, you know, a lot of people in esports, um, we are guilty of looking at esports like an evangelism type of situation where we have to save the world and prove that esports is the golden opportunity, right? Um, but none of, so we, in short, we are thinking of it like from Bill Gates' mindset, like we are all going to save the world with esports. But the truth is you can't, uh, you know, save, you can't be Bill Gates without actually making the money to be of value as Bill Gates. So grow your business. And as you grow your business, people will see the value, people will see the growth and the impact, the, the impact of people through your business. And that's what's going to shift the mindset of esports. What I keep hearing both what of you talking about, of you is, talking about is, how, is how, uh, how, how important it is to, uh, how important to is that create value. To Value. If you don't have value, if you don't have it's like value, you're not going to be talking. Like sponsors aren't going to be li listening to you. Listen Investors are not going to be listening to you. So, in Ireland, are accelerators, are accelerators a common way for esports e businesses, e businesses to get up and running? To get up and running? I think accelerators are, think are accelerators a great way for are, any are business to get up and running. Business you business know, they, they give you, you know, a grounding, they give, they give you good grounding, mentorship. You, you know, you have your, your business plans and your ideologies challenged, you know, which, which you know, if you're an open minded and of a growth mentality, that's a good thing. Um, if you take criticism, then badly, then maybe not. Um, but, but, you know, if you're going, if you're going down the road of, of starting a business or certainly, you know, what you would say is an emerging tech business or, or, or even a technology business, then an accelerator is a really, really strong way to go. But I, I think just picking up on, on, on just something that uh, Chove was saying, you know, um, you know, about investment and, um, you know, getting out there, I, I think a large part of, um, of, of the investment journey is, is being able to tell your story, you know, of what you're wanting to do, what you want to achieve. I mean, Investors invest in people, really. You know, I, I used to always hear, hear this, the, the, these, uh, the, the people in, in the NDRC um, accelerator, and you say, you back the jockey, not the horse. You know, and, you know, are you the right jockey to guide, to guide this business? You know, have you got success in, in either private, um, institutionalized work, you know, or in the field of entrepreneurship and startups? You know, can you lead teams? Can, can you you know, can you make me my money back and some, you know, and that's what they're looking to you to be able to give them that confidence, you know, so, you know, it, it, it's a challenge, you know, and I think the, the other piece that, that's, that stood out for me over recent weeks was particularly around esports investments. And I think it's, it's been a positive is the, um, is the phase, phase clan IPO, you know, so we, everybody's been waiting for this, for months and months, there's been a nervousness around this. You know, esports was all doom and gloom. Investment was slowing down in in esports organizations. You know, there was no monetary value. You know, in esports. You know, and now we've got you know like they not quite doubled yet, but but they had they had at one point almost. You know, it's it's trading about fifteen dollars fifty, which is up on the cost now uh, on their launch price. So so that's a real positive. And the other thing to note around that is 
the Cowboys became the most expensive franchise in sport um, yesterday or today um, for the sake of prosperity, we'll say in August. Um, and they hit an eight billion valuation. OK, and that, if you go back to the 90s, Jerry Jones was a lunatic for for um, for spending 190 million to buy them. Donald Trump pulled out of, of a deal for them and said, you know, good luck. They'd be gone in a couple of years. So really, if you've got an idea, you shouldn't listen to anybody on your gut and go with it. Is the because nobody knows how something's going to turn out, you know, really. You know, you'll always have naysayers. You'll always have a bit of doom and gloom. And then you'll have always cheerleaders and champions, you know. So finding a right balance, listening to the right people, getting objective um, feedback is kind of the way to go from any investment proposition, not just esports. Yeah, what I hear you t say there is, yeah, yeah. you commented earlier about, you know, being able to take criticism. And whether it's, you know, in an accelerator program or any kind of business situation. You need a good team, you need good mentors, and you need to know how to work with them to your benefit, to their benefit. And I also really like when you're talking about you know, um, bet on the jockey, not on the horse. I mean, that is so true in, uh, mm. in it, it, certainly in investment. And I think it's it probably true in Africa and it's probably true um, in Ireland as well. So. The last thing that we wanted to kind of just briefly talk about, because we're running out of time here, but merchandising, because merchandising can be a a, 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 for, a a way to generate revenue. And I should, oh, I should have my team Gem, uh, Gematrix um, t-shirt on, which is right, right up in, in the other room, because um, I participated in your merchandising program. Chelway, can you just talk about what merchandising is, how, how it's working for your organization there in Zambia? Uh, yeah, merchandising is working well uh, for us, um, especially now that we partnered uh, with Acquire. So Acquire is uh, our, our more like our partner when it comes to merchandising. So because of our partnership, we're able to produce our merchandise and ship it globally. Um, so that's pretty great for us. Uh, then uh, the other thing is that uh, I think merchandising in general is a great way to build um, more of your brand and more of your community because people get to carry your brand with them. So it could be a coffee mug, it could be a water bottle, a t-shirt, a cap. So your brand gets to be in the face of the players. It also um, is a great way for advertising for companies because, you know, um, uh, eSports jersey is more like a walking billboard. So whichever tournament your players are going to, Whichever, you know, the eyes that will be on those jerseys will be, you know, millions of millions of thousands of eyes, depending on the, the, the actual tournament, whether it's a League of Legends tournament or EVO. Um, but there will be so many eyes on that. So I believe that merchandise is a great way for uh, brands to really uh, market themselves within the teams and uh, influence uh, the communities. But also it's an opportunity for teams to create value and create fun, fun activities with the players, uh, with the communities as well. Because you have, it's like, it's like so much fun because of the creativity. You can create so much. So even when, uh, when it comes to me, I look at my favorite esports teams, uh, like 100 Thieves, Team Liquid. I always look at how they partner with um, other entities to create fun merchandise. For example, um, I love the Team Liquid and Marvel partnership. So they created jerseys based on, uh, you know, uh, Marvel characters. Uh, uh, you, you had uh, Iron Man, Captain America. You know, it creates fun and a way for you to generate revenue. 100 Thieves has also seen success um, with um, monetizing revenue. So it's something that we are also building on, and so far it has been going well. Most of our our customers are outside Zambia. I think maybe it's because we, 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 we charge in USD and we have a, a situation right now that's hitting um, the economy because uh, a lot of esports teams have been hit by, I think it's the inflation because of the war and what's happening in the US. So shipping costs have really skyrocketed. So a lot of uh, esports teams are putting certain things on the shelf and staying out of stock or increasing on the price. So we're in a moment where we're being affected uh, but we're still optimistic. So it's just a matter of pivoting and saying, we'll just sell t-shirts. 
<laughs> and we'll make, uh, we'll make cool t-shirts and expand on selling t-shirts that are cheaper to ship. But yeah, so that's where we are. But so far, merchandising has been great. One of the complications that you're describing there that, 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 that even, even Trev probably, probably runs into in, in his, part, in of his part of the world is still the, uh, yeah, um, yeah, cost of currency. Cost I currency. mean, the, the exchange rate the exchange and how that can impact how things because nothing's done in the back end. Trev, do you find that merchandising to be a big part of the esports enterprises in your part of the world? in your part of the world? I, I think if you're at the size of a hundred thieves or a phase or a fanatic, you know, and you created, you know, a brand that kind of almost transcends esports and gaming, then I think merchandising is um, is a fantastic way to, um, you know, to, to drive revenue. Um, I think what a lot of people kind of need to remember, though, is, is, you know, what drives you know, what, what drives, drives the need drives to get need your favorite hoodie from an esports team or your jersey from an esports team? Jersey, it, really it, really it really is kind of three things. It's what, things. Kind, of what kind of community have you built up um, around your around, around your esports your, organization? Your What's your the level of um, um, fandom that that's linked to that? How culturally relevant is your is your merchandise? How cool is it? How how casual it is? How street is it? Is you know and and then, and, you know, and the, then, the third point, you know, the, which the I'm going to stall point. myself for three seconds because I've confused myself and forgot what the third point was, but I know it was brilliant, was, no, what's your, what's your strategy around getting that out there? How are you getting, how are you getting it? I mean, I'm very interested to, to you know, to learn about, um, you know, what Cholva is doing with Acquire, I think it is, and that distribution, because one of the biggest challenges you see is, you know, esports teams, you know, they partner with, with maybe mainstream you know, sporting goods providers like Nike and Adidas, you know, and because they're not at the size of a Premier League football club, the fulfillment isn't the same. So it becomes a real challenge for these guys to to tap into into that. So um, I think those three those three pieces are, are, are par- important parts of the jigsaw. And I think once you do that, you know, I think you've got a really good opportunity to drive revenue and yeah, be relevant. Now, it, 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 it's, it's kind of the same the same story everywhere when it comes to uh, the merchandising side of things, no matter no matter where you are. And one of the things I always look to is uh, here, I mean, here in Burbank, it's like, you know, Disney Marvel is just down the street. Um, Warner Brothers is a little bit further. DC is down there. But those companies are built to a large part on consumer products and to take that IP out there and to do something with it. So, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of models to follow. Hey, you know, I really appreciate it. Any last words from, from either of you guys here? I mean, we're kind of re- um, using up our, our time here. Any, any last words? Trev? Uh, no, only connect with Cholwe. It sounds like she uh, she knows a lot of what's going on and I'm going to be connecting with her and having a chat. So it's um, that, I've enjoyed this chat. Great, great. Cholwe, any, any, any last words there? So is your is your is your is your is your oh your, sorry uh, <laughs> oh yeah my so, mic so was let me, off. Let, let, uh, let, let, let me let me just start over again. <laughs> so Joey, any last words? Okay. Any last words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so last words. Um, I look forward to connecting with Trev. And um, one thing I would like to advise anyone who is starting uh, their business in esports to not look at it as a short term success type of story, but to look at it in the long term for the long haul. Uh, esports is in its genesis. Yes, we've had a lot of success over the years as, uh, as an industry, but we are really at the genesis of where this is going. Uh, so we have to be aggressively patient. And we also have to look at it from a business perspective. Even as much as we love gaming and we are passionate about it, always remember to look at it from a business perspective. Always remember uh, to look at your value. Always remember to build a strong team. Um, And always remember to take care of yourself, your mental health, and make sure that you are still active and um, really ready to take on the challenge because it's a very challenging journey. Uh, it's not easy, so make sure you have your support system as well. So those are the last words I have. I really like when you say, really aggressively, like when you say patient. aggressively patient. That's a, that's a really good term. I'm going to get a T-shirt with that on it. That on it. 
I think I'll do. I think I'll I'll design that. <laughs> <laughs> All yours, all yours, all yours. Uh, no, no, thank no, you. That, I, that, that, that is a, that's just a really that's good a, term. That's aggressively really good patient. Term. That's that's exactly <laughs> that's, that's uh, exactly uh, um, good advice uh, for anyone. Good hey, advice for again, anyone. thanks both both of you, Trev, Joey, for taking the time here. This is the Gamers Change Lives podcast. This season two is follow the money, play games, create jobs, change lives. Thanks. This is Tom Leonard. <laughs>